So my name is Dr. Liz Cavan. I'm a naturopathic doctor who practices here in Helena. And I've lived here for four years. I um, grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I studied naturopathy in uh, Portland, Oregon. <clears throat> so just do, do people need to know what naturopathic medicine is? Should I do a brief explanation of that? OK. Um, there's four or five schools in the United States, and it's a four to six year program. Some people do a dual degree where they study naturopathy and then they study acupuncture, and that takes about six years. I did naturopathy only, and it took me four years. And a lot of the classes at the beginning of the training, the first two years are didactic. They're very similar to what MDs study. We do a lot of um, microbiology, histology, uh, pharmacology, all the ologies, and anatomy, and physiology. And then we also did lab diagnosis and um, physical diagnosis, all those similar things that MDs do. And we then the second two years were herbal training and nutrition, homeopathy, hydrotherapy. I'll talk a little bit about hydrotherapy tonight. And we, have te we don't have teaching hospitals, we have teaching clinics. And I, when I went to school in Portland, Oregon, there are different low-income clinics located throughout the city, and the naturopathic students volunteer their time and work with people in the general public. And then there's a main teaching clinic. Let's see, what else did I want to tell you? Before I became a naturopathic doctor, I studied botanical medicine with a woman named Dr. Tiaroni Lodog. She, I was, grew up in New Mexico, as I said, and I was working at a herb store in New Mexico in the late 80s. And she, I found out about her and decided to study with her. And she has since become an MD and worked a lot with Andrew Weil. Um, now she's writing books and doing online courses. And she travels a lot and speaks all over the country. I also had the great opportunity to study with Paul Bergner, and he's a master herbalist who uh, used to have a school in Boulder, and now he's living in Portland, and he takes people on, um, he does trainings with them and then takes them into the woods and teaches them about the herbs on the Pacific Northwest. I also had the good fortune to study a little bit with Michael Moore, who's since passed. He's a well-known herbalist who's written several of the book, his books. I would highly recommend his books if you're somebody who wants to go out in the woods and try to identify them and learn the uses of the plants in the Rocky Mountains. So I've, I've been studying botanical medicine and using herbs for since the 80s. When I worked at the herb store in Albuquerque, I saw people come in who were using herbs and they were getting better and that was pretty amazing to see. I, when I lived in Albuquerque, there's a center there called the Ayurvedic Institute and it teaches the traditional medicine of India and I had the opportunity to study there and work there. So it's been a big part of my life for a while. Uh, I also did massage therapy before I became a naturopath. Enough about me. Uh, did everybody read the book? Some people? Most people? So we'll just give, for those of you who didn't have a chance to read the book, um, this was the book for the big read, Earthsea, A Wizard of Earthsea, and it's about Ged is the main character who ends up unleashing this shadow and then has to go and, and contain the shadow before the shadow takes over. And, turns everything to darkness. So that's a very brief <laughs> summary. <laughs> and I was asked to speak tonight, and I thought to myself, what am I going to talk about? I'm not trained in wizardy, wizardry or anything similar to wizardry other than herbs. And I thought it would be fun to talk about, uh, you know, at one point Ged gets injured terribly injured because when he unleashed the shadow, he almost lost his life, right? And ends up with a scarred face, and then he ends up going on this quest. So I thought what would be good 
tonight is to talk a little bit about nature cure, the history of naturopathy, but also talk about herbs that maybe he would have used to heal his face, to heal himself while, from his injury, and then some plants that he would have taken with him while he was journeying, because he had quite the journey through all these different islands. And he would have needed herbs for stamina, he would have needed herbs to maybe help him get warm, because it seemed like a really cold, dark place to me, um, some of the islands. And he would have needed herbs that maybe we call them um, nurturing herbs to just help him stay strong, to keep him from getting sick. So I decided to cover a variety of plants that I thought that he could use to help him heal or that he would have with him while he was traveling. And of course, there are so many varieties of plants that I could have talked about. And I just settled on a few. Uh, if, there, if anybody wants tea, there's tea in the back. And it's already brewed, so don't add a tea bag to your cup. Uh, a little bit about the history of naturopathy. Back in the 1800s in Germany, there were doctors were doing what I would consider pretty um, intense therapies, you know, bloodletting and uh, heavy metal therapy, and uh, it was definite. It wasn't necessarily the most uh, productive therapies, and so some people who had grown ill and weren't necessarily being helped decided to turn to nature. And one of those, I can get you a book. Excuse me, I'm going to grab a book. Here's a picture of some of the people that were, and they're s sitting in snow and they're barefoot. <laughs> so they were, these were really hardy people. <laughs> and one of them, priest, Father Knipe is what I call him. He's a priest. He had tuberculosis, or was diagnosed with it, and heard about um, a doctor that was doing nature cure and decided to try it. And he, so what these, most of them were men. I really haven't heard about very many women who were doing it. Maybe there were women doing it, and they just, it just didn't get written down. Uh, they went back to nature and would do a lot of alternating hot and cold, or people um, walking barefoot on the earth, um, putting, exposing themselves to waters from streams, eating fresh food. Other people were doing hot therapies. It was, uh, I think they were just experimenting and trying to figure out what uh, using water, how water could help them heal. And they were getting better. And actually, uh, Father Knipe has a huge, had a huge following of people. And his products are still available in Europe. Um, you might see them, or you might recognize the name Knipe. And it's from him and his uh, therapies that he started in Germany. So one of his patients, was Benedict Lust, and I don't know exactly what was wrong with him, but he went to be healed and do the nature cure therapies that were offered by uh, Father Knipe, Knipe, I don't know how to say it, and he decided to come to the United States to be like an ambassador for Knipe healing, Knipe healings, and he is the father of naturopathy. So, when I talk about naturopathy, it's not just healing with water. Um, back in Germany, some of the healers that were having great success with helping people were using fresh diets and herbs. And um, I don't think homeopathy had spread very far back then, but it was getting good sleep, getting exercise. If you think about, I was trying to to picture this in my mind. The Industrial Revolution was going on right about that time, and a lot of people were living in the city, and it wasn't very sanitary, and there was starting to be more pollution. Is, would you all agree with that? 
So I think that what happened was people returned to the country to get, he to get well because they were living in environments that weren't very conducive to good health. And so I just wanted to give you that brief history. And I think I found a picture of, this is a journal that um, Benedict Lust created, and the naturopath and the herald of health. And so in the 1800s in the United States, in the early 1900s, there were quite a few people doing uh, natural medicine. There were several naturopathic colleges. There were hospitals. There was homeopathic hospitals. And then several things all kind of happened at once. Um, the germ theory became more prevalent. Penicillin was discovered. Uh, there were, was a group of people that were moving, really moving away from Nature Cure, and they started to have a greater influence and um, uh, kind of took the, took the ability to practice away from those people, and it became more of an allopathic type of medicine. So I'm not going to go into that history. It's pretty interesting, but there were just a lot of things that were influencing the shift from using nature to cure to the germ theory, and then penicillin helping a lot of people made the shift too. So you can, uh, I'll pass these books around. These, this one's out of print. Um, this one I'm not sure, but there are, it's an interesting read, the history of natural medicine. So I'll give that to you. I do have a handout, and Suzanne will be back in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about some of the herbs. So I just have pictures of the herbs. And then I have a handout that goes along with the pictures. Does anybody know, use Arnica? So what do you use Arnica for? Sore muscles. Sore muscles, pain, inflammation. inflammation. So Arnica is a great plant. It grows in our mountains here. You can, uh, I didn't bring my arnica oil that I made, but I'll tell you real quick how you can make a herbal oil. And you can make it with plants that are growing in your garden, like calendula. Flowers are great for um, the skin. And what you do is you harvest the plant, the, the leaves and the flowers. I usually just harvest the arnica flowers. And I try to make sure that I find a stand where there's a lot of flowers growing. So you don't want to go and harvest where there's, har there's not very many flowers, because we want to continue to have them. And um, I consider plants our allies. So I try to harvest them with the respect and uh, give thanks that they are going to give me some medicine to help me heal if I need to. So what you do is you pick the flowers, and then you wilt them for 24 hours. So what I do is put them on a cookie sheet and put them in a place where they're not going to be exposed to sunlight and that's fairly dry, not too hot, and just let them wilt for 24 hours. If you wait longer than that, they'll start to dry up on you, depending, like in New Mexico anyway, they'll dry really fast, and here too probably. Then what you do is you put them in a jar and you pour oil over them. And you want to pour the oil to the top of the jar and then you put a lid on the jar. And uh, then you just shake it every now and then. And the reason why you wilt them for 24 hours is you want to get the extra moisture out because what can happen is you can get a mold growing on top of your oil. Now you can put a little bit of vitamin E oil if you want to help it act as a preservative, and then that will keep your oil from getting moldy. But you might want to check it every now and then to make sure that it's not developing a mold on the top. And, that's, and then you just let it sit for about a month, and then take a cheesecloth and squeak, pour your, um, well, I can show you I have this. What, what kind of oil do you use? You can use olive oil, you can use almond oil, I made some salve recently because I wanted to practice, and I just use olive oil. The only thing about olive oil is it has a strong odor. So I like almond oil because it doesn't smell very much. Um, 
but you can put your cheesecloth over like a glass container and then you know maybe put a rubber band around it or something and then pour your oil into it and then squeeze squeeze it and get all the oil out of the flowers and separate the flowers from the oil so it's really easy to make another one fun one is st. John's wort I don't know if it grows around here I know I used to harvest it when I lived in the Denver area I'd go up in the mountains and harvest it but it's a really wonderful oil it's good for the nerves and it's good for healing bruises um, so arnica is our is our friend for bruises and um, trauma so you don't ever want to use arnica oil internally like don't ever drink it as a tea because it's very caustic it'll burn the inside of your esophagus and your stomach so only use the oil or make a, like a compress does everybody know what a compress is make a compress like use a cheesecloth and put the mashed flowers in there and then put it directly on your skin you could do that uh, and you can use it homeopathically internally, but it's very, very dilute, and it's not going to have that effect of causing a burn in your stomach or your esophagus. The um, arnica oil that you're making, is that, how long is that good for? I mean, well, I, I made mine last year, and I just keep it in the fridge. Okay. And, um, so you don't see it going rancid? Or no, I keep in my oils in the fridge because I don't use them up real fast. And I also try to re have a sense of how much I'm going to use. I don't want to harvest a bunch of flowers and then waste them. So, um, you know, a, a little goes a long way. But you can use Arnica for sore muscles. You, I mean, like if you bruised yourself or if you, had, you were healing from a burn but it wasn't open, don't, I would recommend that you not put a salve on an open cut. Because you could, you could, um, bacteria could start to grow in there, and that would not be a good thing. So, but you could put it on after the scabs come off, or once it's scabbed over, you could put your arnica on there. Arnica is great after surgery. You could take it internally because if you think about it, surgery is a type of a trauma. So arnica is for trauma, any kind of sprain, strain, bruise. And I don't want to sound like I'm against surgery because I'm not, but. It is a type of trauma. So Arnica can really help heal, help people heal. Can we get, have the handouts passed out, please? Do you want open one or just one? Just one, the big one. Okay. Please. Any questions about Arnica? Okay, we're gonna do, go next. California poppy. I love, 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 love California poppy. It's such a cheery, cheerful plant. I used to live in, I've lived a lot of places, just so you know. And I lived in California, and the California poppy, it grows everywhere. It's so um, cheerful, and uh, I don't know. I just, it's one of my favorites. And maybe we could dim the lights just a little bit. This great, this plant, I chose this plant. We have to get back to Ged, okay? So Ged was injured, and the Arnica would have really helped him heal, his face heal. Um, if he was injured while he was on his quest, the arnica would have been a... You mean it would have helped with scarring? It would have helped, like, before the scarring. Before scarring. Before scarring. But I just, this just occurred to me. I didn't um, add this to my list, but helichrysum. Are you familiar with helichrysum essential oil? Helichrysum is a flower, a, I think it's the flower that's used. I haven't used it a lot, so don't quote me on that. But it's great for scars. Um, it's not inexpensive, but it's really wonderful. So the reason why I chose California Poppy is he had a lot of pain. And this one is really good for pain, and it's really safe. It's a real safe herb. It is in the poppy family, but it's not going to make somebody um, high like a poppy seed would or opium poppy. It's a, it's a much milder form, and you can drink it in a tea, you can put it in a capsule. Uh, and if you're going to make a tea, you just would use the above ground part and dry it and then um, steep it. 
So do you know, do all of you make teas? Do I need to talk to about making teas? I'll talk about making teas real quickly. So when you're making a bulk tea, you want to use flour, flowers and leaves and petals. And what else? You want to steep them. So you boil your water first, and then you put them in the boiled water, because if you boil them, it breaks them down too much. Now there's some barks that you don't want to boil. You don't really want to boil slippery elm bark, and you don't want to boil marshmallow root. Those are ones that have a lot of um, mucilaginous quality, and that mus mucilaginous means like uh, when you pour water over something and it really expands, like psyllium seeds, they get really kind of goopy, and that quality is very healing. It's what we call a demulcent, even cinnamon. If you make a tea out of cinnamon, you'll notice that it kind of gets a little stringy. I don't know how to describe it, but that's a demulcent quality, and you don't want to boil an herb that has that quality because when you drink it, you want it to soothe and coat the inter your internal organs, your organs of digestion. Generally with roots and barks, um, you want to simmer them. And seeds, like fennel seed or coriander seed or cumin, you want to simmer them for about 20 minutes. And then you uh, 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, you can simmer them even longer. The Chinese, they'll simmer herbs for a long time, but a minimum of 20 minutes. And then you can add your leaves and your flowers afterwards. So with California poppy, you, it's one you want to steep. And it, it, I don't know, it might be harder to find. You might be easy, it might be easier to find as an alcohol extract than as a powdered herb. So Ged would have, could have used this for pain. Dulce, I started thinking about uh, his journey and, you know, here in the beginning of the front, we have island after island after island after island. So what do, what's around? Seaweed. Seaweed is a great source of vitamins and minerals. I mean, I need to get one of those handouts. Uh, so dulse is very, thanks Suzanne, it's very versatile. You can make it into a powder, you can um, put it in soup. Uh, I was thinking about that couple that he came across, the elderly couple on the small island. It's like, what the heck did they live off of, right? <laughs> maybe seaweed was one of the things that they were living off of. So he could have maybe had some seaweed dried seaweed that he just would put on his food, and it's a, seaweed's a great source of minerals, and iodine, and um, it's just a very nutritive food. So I decided to include that, and I actually brought some seaweed snacks. And I brought some herbs, I almost forgot. I brought a few herbs for us to look at. So we might have to turn up the lights to just a titch. So have you guys ever eaten these? So I'm going to open one and pass it around. I have a couple, and you can try them and see what you think. Maybe they're a little harder to open than one would think. So I didn't get any fancy flavored seaweeds. These just, this is just roasted seaweed. Mmm, yum. <laughs> Let, let's have a party. Roasted seaweed. Mmm. <laughs> I'm going to open another one. You can just let it dissolve in your mouth. It actually tastes really good. I think. Here, I'm going to let you open that. Okay. I'm struggling. All right. And then this is another seaweed. This is nori, which is one that I don't have on my list. But... It says here you can toast it in the skillet. Um, you can munch it as a snack after you toasted it. 
I want to see what it tastes like. Sometimes, like kombucha, I mean not kombucha, ugh, I'll have to think about it. There's a seaweed that's really yummy that some, we used to snack on when I was in herb school. <laughs> yeah, this one tastes pretty seaweedy. I don't think, yeah, this one tastes really fishy, but I'll pass this around, you can look it up. Yeah, <laughs> some of them. I mean, they when you go buy them, they have um, they have uh, sesame on them, or they're. It's pretty good when you uh, put it in a skillet. And actually, when I cook with seaweed, I don't use very much because the taste can it can overtake things. That's okay. So seaweed is probably, I mean, I don't know, but I was thinking they might eat a lot of seaweed because they're island people. Yarrow. Has anybody used yarrow as medicine? Yeah, this one tastes really bitter. So if you're going to make a yarrow tea, be prepared <laughs> for bitter. But when I studied Ayurvedic medicine, Dr. Ladd, our, my instructor, he always said bitter is better. Bitter is better because it stimulates your digestion and it kind of stimulates the action in your body. Um, yarrow, I picked yarrow because it's what we call a styptic, and styptic herbs stop bleeding. So if you're on a quest and somebody's chasing you and trying to hurt you, it might be good to have something to stop bleeding. So you could make a flat, uh, powder out of yarrow or yarrow flowers, and then you could put it. I have actually never used it for stopping bleeding. I haven't really had the need to do that because I've used band-aids. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing about yarrow is um, it's a, what we call a diaphoretic. So it makes you sweat. And I'm somebody who believes that fevers can be a good thing. Our body, that our body makes fever for a reason. And sometimes people have a hard time generating a fever. So you want to, like ginger will make you sweat. If you, if you drink ginger tea when you're sick, it makes you sweat. And so Yara will do that too. It's a diaphoretic. It makes you sweat. It helps build a fever. So why do you think we would want a fever? As long as it doesn't get too high, and as long as we stay dehydrated, I mean, stay hydrated, and don't get dehydrated, fevers are good. Can you think about why they would be good? What? Yeah, it, what does the temperature do? What, if your temperature is going up, it's killing the organisms, right? And when you have a fever, do you eat? Are you like, do you really want to eat? Sure. Not really. Like children, they spike fevers fast, and they don't want to eat, and they don't want to do anything, right? And that's because the fever is taking energy away from digestion, and it, the body is using the energy to create the fever so that the organisms that are causing the illness can be killed by the heat, but also by a lack of nutrients. So the, the important thing, now I got every, I wish I had something that tasted better. Sorry, I gave you a seaweed and I don't have anything yummy to <laughs> replace it. I don't have any honey or anything. Um, sorry about that. So with the fevers, the thing that you will absolutely have to make sure is that people stay hydrated because that's when they get seizures is when they don't, when they're not hydrated. And then fevers above 104, or 106 over a period of time, those can become dangerous. So you want to manage fevers. I'm all about managing fevers and helping people lower their fever by putting a wet cloth on them and helping the evaporation of the water will help them cool down. And then the fever will come back up and then you help it cool down again. So it takes a lot of work to manage a fever. But the body is making a fever for a reason. So I would imagine that Ged, when he had his injury, when he brought up the dark 
shadow spirit, whatever, shadow side of himself, some might think, he probably had a raging fever. And so I don't know if yarrow would have been the best thing to give him because you don't want to make the fever higher. But if you were, um, if he was in his travels starting to have stomach upset or feeling like maybe he was coming down with something, yarrow would be a good ally, a good plant to have to make a tea. And then of course it would help stop bleeding. Okay, next is shepherd's purse. So shepherd's purse is another one that stops bleeding. And this one is used a lot for um, uh, birthing moms, like in a sitz bath after they have their child or if they're, they've had their child and you need to staunch the bleeding a little bit. This is a good one for that. Um, so I just put this in mostly because it um, helps stop bleeding. So this is another one that he could have had. And... Um, Next on my list is alfalfa. And I chose alfalfa as something to help him to be like a food, a powder or a tea to help provide vitamins and nutrients. It's what we call an alterative or a um, tonic tea. It's a, what we call a blood builder. So it helps nourish the body. It's a nourishing tonic plant. And it's not a plant that really you would use to fight an infection. It's a plant that you would use every day as a tonic or drink on a regular basis to help provide yourself with um, minerals and nutrients and healthy, um, just a healthy constitution, for lack of a better way to describe it. So in naturopathy, we have a concept of terrain, and the concept of terrain is, how many gardeners do we have in here? A few people that like to garden. So are your plants healthier when they have healthy soil? Absolutely. And uh, so in naturopathic medicine, we try to create a healthy terrain in our body so that when we get exposed to things, then we don't get sick. It's like having this plant grow in healthy soil. So a part of creating healthy terrain is eating fresh foods, getting sleep, exercise, and you could make a tonic tea, and you could have one of the ingredients be um, alfalfa. It tastes pretty green, so you might want to add some mint to make it more palatable. So I just added this one because I was thinking about I, was, I kept going back to Ged being on his quest <laughs> and thinking of herbs that he could have with him to help him. And so this one would be a great one to help him keep his stamina. Because he was on a boat a lot, right? It's a lot of work. Another one, nettles, is another one that is what we call an um, alterative. It's a good dry. I have some nettles, actually. Don't try it because it's just going to taste like nothing. But you can smell it if you want. The, I got these at the herb store, at the um, real food market. <clears throat> so when I make teas, I kind of just experiment. So I can't really give you a recipe. Um, if I generally what I do is start with a quart of water, which is four cups of water, and then if I was going to make a nettle tea, I would have maybe four cups of water and two tablespoons. So you can start there, and then you can make it to taste for you. You might put like a tablespoon of nettles, a tablespoon of alfalfa, and then um, a teaspoon of mint because mint has a much stronger flavor, and it's going to take over your tea if you use two tablespoons of mint with other herbs. Uh, generally, there's different herbs that we use in teas to make them taste better. Mint, hibiscus. Hibiscus will give it more of a sour taste than a sweet taste. Um, licorice root, but you have to be careful with licorice root because it'll raise blood pressure. So if somebody has high blood pressure, they should not be drinking licorice root tea. Um, orange peels can make things taste better. Uh, a little bit of ginger, cinnamon. 
those are some things that you can add to your teas to make them a little bit more palatable. So nettles, back to nettles. Nettles is also a food, right? I have actually never eaten nettles, but I would like to try them. And you get them in the spring. And there's a way you have to prepare them so that the, um, you don't get stung because they have the little hairs all over them that sting you. But you can make it, you can stew it and then eat it. So maybe um, this was something that Ged found on an island and ate. You know, or his, who is the wise, what was the name of the wise mentor that he left? Because, Ogeon Ogi, Ogi or, I bet you he harvested nettles, <laughs> right? Because he was very contemplative and just very grounded person. He probably used a lot of these plants in his, in his rural dwelling place. So I chose nettles because they're, oops, I did it again. They're nutritive. Okay, we're good. Is it back? Yep, it's back. Whoops. There, wait, wait for it. <laughs> I apologize for our technology. <laughs> so I'll pass this around while we're getting the technology. These are calendula. Does anybody grow calendula around in their yard? Their calendula is super easy to grow. And it's one of those that'll start to take over a little bit. But the flowers are really beautiful, yellow and orange. And you can smell this. It smells really nice. Um, and uh, this one is really great topically for skin. So this would have been good for him to put on his face. And it's also um, healing for the digestive tract, inflamed digestive tissues. And I also have some calendula oil that I'm going to put in the salve when we make the salve. Calendula? Yeah, I was thinking calendula. Or calendula, people say it that way too. So this is a picture of the calendula. Oops, dang it, I gotta stop moving this thing. Keep moving it. It's a habit. It's okay, I'll just stop touching it. Except for the arrows. So this one is a one where you could harvest the flowers, just the flowers is what I harvest, and then you would wilt them for 24 hours, and then you would pour oil over them and let them sit in the oil for a month, shake them on occasion, make sure you could add just a little bit of vitamin E as a preservative, natural preservative, and then you, um, you make sure you don't grow a mold on your oil. That's why you, you you don't want really to have very much air between the top of the jar and the lid, because then it'll keep the oil, keep mold from growing on top of your plant. So you want to make sure that the plants are totally covered with oil, and that the oil goes almost to the top of your jar. And then you can squeeze out the oil from the flowers, and it's really lovely to put on your skin. It's very uh, soothing. This one, Irish moss, I have that as well. This one, don't taste this one because you won't be happy with me. But <laughs> you can smell it. And um, it has a little bit of a ocean smell similar to the seaweed. This one, I've tried making teas with it. It gets real thick. It can overpower the taste of the tea. Um, so I need to experiment with it some more, uh, but I included it because um, it can be used to make a, like a thickener for pudding because it has the carrageen in it. And so it's used as a source of carrageen, which is a thickener. And um, you know, here in my notes it says that if you eat ice cream, you've probably eaten Irish moss extract because it's a thickener. And I found this, I, f I forgot to put the um, name of the company, I apologize, but I found this great company that sells all these different 
uh, sea vegetables out of Maine, and they're all organic and sustainably harvested, which is important because we want to be able to continue to harvest them. And they test them for heavy metals and herbicides because unfortunately we've polluted our waters. So we need to be thinking about what um, might be in them. And it's good to get sources that have been tested to make sure they don't have heavy metals. And so I put their website on here if you're interested in trying any of the seaweeds and playing with them. Okay, this is one of my favorite herbs, burdock. Has anybody ever eaten burdock root? It's really yummy. You, you want to um, get the smaller roots. You want, now is the time to harvest burdock because you harvest er roots in the fall because all the energy is going, the plants are losing their leaves, the plants aren't putting energy out to make flowers. Their energy is going more inward because they're getting ready to be dormant over the winter, right? So now is a good time to harvest roots, and you want to harvest the smaller burdock roots. The bigger ones are going to taste more woody. They're not going to have as much flavor. Sometimes you can find them in the um, store. Sometimes Real Foods has them. Sometimes the Natural Grocers has them. I like to um, I scrub them down like I would a carrot, and then peel off the outer uh, skin and then chop them and put them in soup or you can make uh, fresh tea or you can put them in stir fry they have kind of a nutty they're yummy I like them they can overpower so don't and I have burdock as well so you can um, smell this one you can get this at real food market I'll just make um, tea. I make burdock tea fairly regularly this herb is great for your liver it's a detoxifier and it's real good for your skin. Um, it's a tonic herb as well. It ha can help regulate blood sugar. So this, I picked this one for Ged because I thought that it would be helpful for him to have some liver, a liver tonic herb, and um, in case he got exposed to toxins or something when somebody evil was trying to get him. <laughs> so I'll let you pass that around. And burdock, it'll take over. Oops, I did it again. Dang it. Keep hitting that thing. Any questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could use it maybe or seaweed if you were feeling anemic. But burdock is one you also have to think about if you're not growing the herbs where you're harvesting them. Okay, I never harvest herbs that are by a road, right? Because the road, the runoff from the road could be putting contaminants in the soil and the roots are, so flowers I would be less concerned with. Roots definitely don't harvest them by the road. Thank you. Okay, we have another seaweed. This one is, uh, Atlantic seaweed. So I just chose it because I was trying to think of a nice variety of things that he would have with him. Okay, so some leaves, some roots, some powders, things that would be easily accessed when, when you're um, in an island environment, easily accessible. So I'm not going to talk a lot about this one, but again, it's going to provide um, minerals I will say one time when I lived in Cleveland, Ohio for a time and I went to a presentation that was given by some soil specialists, I don't know what they're, scientists who study soil, I don't know what that's called. Um, and they said that, I asked, they were saying that our soil is so depleted of nutrients and I asked them about organic and they said even organic like especially the big organic farms possibly. I worked on some organic farms in the late 80s in Northern California and um, the soil seemed pretty healthy to me. So, but they were saying, I asked them afterwards what would be a good source of minerals if you're not getting them from plants and they said seaweed. So 
So seaweed is a really good source of minerals and vitamins and iodine, but make sure that you're getting seaweed that's been tested for heavy metals, et cetera. Okay, next on my list, because we want to make, oops, I think I'm out of order here. Nope, aloe vera. So, you know, aloe vera is a great one for skin. And inside, you can drink the juice or the gel, and it'll heal any inflamed tissues inside and then outside, of course, for cuts and sunburns. And then uh, the dried inside of the um, leaf, what do they call it, the latex, can be dried. It's a very strong laxative. I would not recommend that if you needed a laxative that you start with aloe because it can make you, like it's a purgative. So, um, so be careful with it if you decide to use it as a laxative, the latex. Not the gel, not the juice, but the latex. Next we have plantain. Has anybody ever um, used plantain to heal a sore or a cut? Or so plantain grows by, can you guess? By the road. Nettles. Nettles. It grows by the road too. <laughs> It grows by nettles, so how convenient is that? If you get stung by nettles, you just take some plantain, mash it up, and put it on your sting. And so plantain is another one that's really great for, this one you best, it's best used fresh. Um, I haven't really played with the oil of plantain. And uh, mushrooms, right? So. Island environment, probably lots of mushrooms, probably had a lot of access. What was that, Odeon, what was his name again? The Ogian? Yeah, I bet you he knew all the mushrooms in the area. I mean, so you think to yourself, they're wizards, why don't they just conjure up some food or something to help themselves, right? I was thinking about that. Well, why am I talking about herbs when they're wizards and they can just make themselves better? But I started thinking about it and they, I would think that if you were on a quest to defeat an evil shadow, that you would want to conserve your energy and not be using your energy casting all these spells to do this, that, or the other thing, right? So, um, so mushrooms would be a great thing. And actually, when I was at Real Food yesterday, somebody that works there let me bring this reishi mushroom. So these are pretty cool. And... Um, you can make a soup with them. You can make tea with them. It, usually they come sliced. Um, so I just thought it would be fun to hang, to pass this one around. Rishi's great for immune. Mushrooms in general, medicinal mushrooms like shiitake, maitake, chaga, um, cordyceps, they're good for stamina. Cordyceps is really great for stamina, as is Rishi. So I was thinking about him getting tired being in the boat all the time and running from the shadow. So he would have needed some mushrooms to help him stay strong. And then chaga and turkey tail, those are great for immune, supporting immune. Like if somebody's wanting to prevent cancer or help address cancer, maitake. So I'll pass this around. And we're going to take a, just a short five minutes, and I'm going to get ready to make this salve. The last thing I have here is bee pollen. Okay, bee pollen would be something full of nutrients that's, um, I didn't put it on my list because I didn't think of it until the last minute, but it would be something that would be easy to carry that's full of nutrients that you could use to help um, stay strong and have good stamina. So let's go over the supplies. Have you, any of you made salve before? Okay. It's real, I just kept it really, really simple. You can get pretty creative if you want uh, to play with all different kinds of oils and different scents. Is anybody in the room really sensitive to odors? A little bit? Okay. How about lavender? Can you handle lavender? Okay, I'll open the bottle and you let me know if it's too strong. We won't, we'll let people put it in their own. So I have two here. I have ylang-ylang and lavender. 
And I'm going to let you smell them, and you tell me if you think they're going to bother you, and we won't put them in the sap. We'll let people put it in afterwards. So I'll pass these around. <clears throat> so what I do when I make a salve, because I'm always working in my kitchen, I don't have a separate space where I can work. And I'm going to get, I have a double boiler. And um, I never, ever, ever put a pan with hot oil on it, in it get the pan and then put the oil in it because the oil um, is going to get hot and it could start a fire. So don't ever do that. Um, always use a double boiler. So I'm going to just get this heating, get my water boiling. And what I do is I put a newspaper around because you're dealing with oil and you're dealing with beeswax and it can get all over everything. It's just easier to have newspaper or um, some kind of wax paper or something. Um, so the supplies I have are my double boiler. I usually use a uh, rubber spatula. They're super easy to clean. Uh, glass is really easy to clean because I use this measuring cup when I'm measuring food. So that's the thing to remember. We're making a salve with oils and beeswax, right? It's not toxic. So when I'm cleaning the things that I've used, I just pour hot water in it to melt the wax, and then I'll do my soap and water after I, so I'll pour hot water in it, pour it out, then wipe it with a paper towel, and then clean it with soap and water. It's really easy to clean up afterwards. Um, so it's nice to have some paper towels that you can use to clean up messes. And these are the oils that we're going to use today. I picked apricot kernel oil and sweet almond oil because uh, they don't have strong odor, and they're both really great for your skin. Uh, avocado oil is really good for your skin. Um, grapeseed oil. There's so many olive oil. So it, it can get a little bit pricey, too. You know, it's up to you how much you want to spend. And then I always add some calendula oil or some St. John's wort just because they're just so nutritive and healing for bruises and um, skin irritation. And then I have little containers for everybody. So we will um, pour salve for everybody. I could actually use somebody screwing off the, the lids, one for everybody here. Thank you. And then probably what we should do next, and you can have a scale. I'm, I don't ever use a scale. I'm, I just, I don't know. I'm a mad scientist, I guess. <laughs> so what I do is I just play around with um, how much beeswax. I play around with the consistency of the stat, salve. So basically what we're doing let me just make sure this is getting hot. What we're doing is we're going to put the oil in the top of our double boiler after our water's boiled. This is going to take a few minutes. I didn't think of that, so we'll just wait a few minutes for that. And then we add our beeswax and let the beeswax melt. And then what I do is I put it in a little bit of a spoon, plastic spoon or a metal spoon, and I stick it in the freezer. And I wait, it doesn't take very long at all for it to harden up. And then you can play around with the texture, the consistency of your salve. So if you want one that's more um, hard, like a lip balm, then you're going to add more wax. If you want it soft so that it's easy to put on, then you're going to have less wax. And I haven't really played with coconut oil because it gets hard when at, uh, at room temperature, so I think that one you have to play around with more. I always just stick with the olive oil and almond oil and maybe the, a little bit of apricot. Thank you. So um, the next, the other thing that we want to do is usually what I do with my beeswax. It's so pretty. Um, you can get it at the farmer's market. You can get it at Real Food Market. Um, 
keep this here where I can use it. Uh, so I usually, what I do, what I'm not going to do here is get a knife hot, like put a knife in hot water or um, if you have a gas stove and get your knife blade really hot and then you can just cut the beeswax. It's so much easier than grating the beeswax. So that's what I do. Or just get smaller, get the beeswax. I couldn't find a smaller um, uh, square of beeswax. So I just bought a pound and this will last for a while. So I'm going to go ahead and grate some beeswax while we're waiting for the um, water to boil. And then we'll measure our oil and we'll put it in. And grating beeswax is kind of hard. And definitely, you're going to just use your grater for beeswax. <laughs> so don't use it for anything else. That's part of the reason why I use a knife. Because the grater will get dull after a while and it's harder, becomes harder to grate. So it doesn't take that long. My water is... How much are you grating? I'm going to grate it one and a half cup. Actually, I think I'm going to grate a little bit less so that you can see what a less um, thick salve is going to be like, and then I'm going to add more. And I'm going to be really strong when I get done. <laughs> I'll have to put some arnica on my shoulder. <laughs> So I'm using a paper plate for this because beeswax is a little harder to deal with when you get it on things. So, you know, if you felt like you were going to make salve on a regular basis, you might just want to go to Goodwill and buy a few things or just go and get some uh, supplies and just only use them for that. So, certainly an option. So that's about half a cup. So it didn't really take me that long to grate a half a cup. And this is getting warm. It's almost ready. And you'll be surprised at how fast. So did that essential oil bother anybody? It's OK? OK. Do you want me to make some without oil for you? Just to make it smell yummy, and uh, lavender is really great for burns, and lavender is also great for calming the nervous system. It's been shown to be effective against anxiety, helping people deal with anxiety. It can also help you sleep, so that's why I like to put lavender in. But we don't have to. I'll make some without for you. You can have your kids do this no. <laughs> if they're old enough, right? <laughs> oh, honey, let's make some salve. You can grate the beeswax. <laughs> That's the most fun. <laughs> and then they won't want to ever help you again. <laughs> so if you are doing this with your kids, just remember you're working with hot things that are hot. But I think it's great to do things in the kitchen with kids, so. I'd encourage you to have them help you. OK, my water is almost boiling, so I'm going to put this in here. And I'm just going to go ahead and let's see. I need this measuring cup. 
So it doesn't matter if there's beeswax in here when I measure my oil because I'm going to put beeswax in there anyway. And so this is the apricot kernel oil. There's four ounces in here. So I put eight ounces of almond oil on the recipe, but really it's four ounces of almond oil and, and four ounces of um, apricot kernel oil. And I have no nails. Does somebody have nails who can get this for me? Thanks. I just don't have nails. Tell us about apricot kernel oil. I've never heard of it. It's just um, really good for your skin. It's nutritive. It's healing for the skin. Um, it doesn't really... Yes, please. It doesn't have a strong odor. You can, here, let me pour some of it out, and then you can pass it around, and then we'll pour the rest in here. So you can see what it smells like. It doesn't really, I like making salves with the oils that don't have odor. Thank you. So I'm just pouring the oil in the pan. If you want to come up here and see, you're welcome to come on up. And you can see the oil is really a different color. Come check out the color of this oil. Ooh, right? Pretty. The flowers are that color, so the oil is going to be the color of the flower. Um, uh, St. John's or oil has a really pretty red color because mm. the I don't know if you've ever seen St. John's work um, but the petals have little tiny red beads on the that out that are along the edge of the petals and so when you make an oil with uh, Hypericum or St. John's where it turns out this beautiful red color you have to be careful with that right because you can get interactions with St. John's if you take it know. internally okay if you take it with medications like MAO inhibitors, you don't want to take it with that. And it'll help clear medications faster through your liver if you use it when you're taking medications. Okay, I'm going to trip over that thing if I'm not careful. So I'm just, it's almost boiling, not quite, so we got to let it get a little bit harder, hotter, because we're going to put the beeswax in there. Okay, I'm just going to add a little bit of wax, and then we're going to see how, this is a cup of wax, and let's see how thick it gets. I brought some olive oil just in case it gets too thick. So you can see the oil, the wax is starting to melt. And this is a really safe way to do this, because we might have to add a little bit of olive oil. Do you wait till it all gets clear again? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to just let it all melt. And then I'm going to put some in a spoon, and we'll, we'll stick it outside the door. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> <Your freezer. laughs> yeah, I might have to add some olive oil. When I made it last, last time I made it, um, I only used, I used uh, 12 ounces of oil, but I thought I used 12 ounces of oil. I tried to write it down. So we're just going to let that melt. I'm going to pour this into here. One thing about the civil boiler, it's really heavy. And then I'm going to start pouring in these little containers. I think I'll put a bunch of them on a plate. This is why I use newspaper. <laughs> Et voila, we have sab. OK, I'm going to put some, olive, some oils in here. 
And I always put the oils in last. I'm just going to use the, a little bit of the ylang ylang. And lavender. Uh, I always forget ylang ylang. I just like it. It just smells good. How do you know how much of the oil takes drops to put in? Uh, I just, the, you have to put quite a bit because it, it will, um, the oil just kind of uh, sucks it up. So definitely you want to put at least 90 or 100 drops in this big of a, okay. All right, so these two do not have any oil in them. Put them over here. And I'm sorry, this is a little hard to make this without getting it on the edge of the thing. So were you asking about, yeah, okay, um, historical data, means, it means flower of flowers. The flowers have been used to cover the beds of newlywed couples on their wedding night, mm. traditionally used in hair formulas to promote, to promote thick, shiny, lustrous hair. I'm trying to pour this without getting it all over everything, and it's proving to be easier said than done. So you might want to wipe around the... I would recommend that you go ahead and screw the lid on your salve and not try it till later because it's not going to be hardened up yet. I think it's actually a pretty good consistency.